Good evening and welcome to tonight's Bible study. We're so glad that you joined us here with the Lombard Church of the Nazarene. We are talking about Christmas and we're getting closer and closer every day to celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. It's our season of Advent. Advent meaning it is coming. Jesus is coming. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the journey to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph were called to go to Bethlehem um, by the Caesar. And so they did, and that's where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So tonight we're going to be taking a look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, as we talk about this story, this journey to Bethlehem. So join with us tonight. Let's begin with Luke chapter 2, with the first verse, verse 1. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That verse begins by saying, in those days, or now is the time. In those days, and it, what's it referring to? Why does it all of a sudden start the story, in those days? It's referring to those days, like a specific period of time that they are referring to. What time, what days? Well, it was the time for the Messiah to be born, as been foretold by the prophets long ago. Daniel was a famous Old Testament prophet, and he predicted um, this time of these eras in history. And if we read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, the beginning of the verse, it says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Here he's talking about kingdoms that are going to be established. And then the, the, the last kingdoms that he's talking about, there will be kings. And in this, in this time that there's going to be something happening. A divided nation will come. And it is in this time that Luke chapter 2 picks up the story from this Old Testament time. Again, if we, we look at this image quickly that Daniel prophesied about, it's an image of a man. And he's saying there's going to be a, an empire that is like a gold head of a man. It's going to be then a silver kingdom uh, like maybe the Medes and the Persians after the Babylonians. And there's going to be a Bronze Era. So many think it's a Greek Empire. Then an Iron Kingdom, like the Roman Empire, which was in power during the time of Christ. But then he says there's going to be a, a broken period where it's iron mixed with clay, which doesn't last. It's going to be a divided time of kings, where kings and kingdoms go through times of division and uncertainty. Well, here we are in the New Testament. After the time of all these prophecies, after the time of all these Old Testament kingdoms and powers, empires that come to be, the announcement of the birth of Jesus comes. And it's saying in those times, the times that Daniel and other prophets were talking about, that Jesus was time to be born has come. And so in those days talks about this. And in these times, Rome is still in power, but Rome has, itself has some power struggles. But nonetheless, Judea becomes a tributary to the Roman Empire. Uh, in other words, they, they pay taxes to the Romans. They are under Roman law, but they are still their own little nation under the, the big empire. They are subordinates. They have to do the things the Romans tell them to. And there's Roman law over their land. See, originally, Jerusalem was taken by Pompey, which was a Roman general, about 60 years before this. And he granted uh, Hyrcanus as high priest over Jerusalem, as a priesthood over the nation. Not as a king, but as the, the priest. And so it's in these times, and these times again in Luke chapter 2, 1. In these days, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And so here we're seeing that Caesar Augustus is now this emperor of this nation. And now, see, we just pick up this story. Now, I know many of you have learned about Rome and the Roman Empire while you were in school. Uh, but just a quick review, if you're not familiar... Mm -hmm. uh, Caesar Augustus, um, by the way, a Caesar is a name for uh, the emperor in the Roman times, a Caesar. Um, and it comes from the name Julius Caesar, which we'll learn, uh, talk about in just a moment here. But Caesar Augustus was not born called Augustus. He was born called Octavian. He was named after his father, Octavian. Now, Octavian's grandmother, his grandmother was the sister of Julius Caesar. 
And Octavian was a talented young man, and Octavian be, uh, came to the attention of his great uncle, Julius Caesar. And I'm sure many of you are a little familiar with the story of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar eventually adopted Octavian as his son. And so he was made officially an heir in 45 BC. So Octavian, the great nephew of Julius Caesar, was adopted by Julius Caesar and, and called the heir for Julius Caesar. Now within a year of that, the Caesar was murdered. And Octavian joined with two others, Mark Anthony and Lepidus, and splitting the dominion of the Rome Empire, the Roman Empire. And so the Roman Empire was split into three, three kingdoms, uh, or three uh, rulers, um, Octavian, Mark Antony, and Lepidus. Now for decades, the Mediterranean world, that area, was known as violence and lots of wars. And um, you have the, these three leaders over this land, and it became worse of a nation. It was very brutal, lots of fighting over power and money and control in these different provinces. Octavian and Antony, though, soon pushed Lepidus out of the picture. And even though his sister married Antony uh, for 13 years, Octavian and Antony existed together as rivals until about 31 BC. For a year, his huge armies assembled and positioned themselves. Now it came to a, a final battle between Octavian and Antony. Antony got together with the help of Cleopatra, a name some of you are familiar with. He got 500 warships. Octavian only had 400 warships. Uh, Antony and Cleopatra had about 100,000 foot soldiers. And Octavian had about 80 in his infantry, so about 20,000 less Octavian had. And they had both about the same size cavalry, around 12,000. But Octavian had a better strategy and more mobile ships, and he defeated the combined forces of Antony and Queen Cleopatra of Egypt at the Battle of Actium. Now Octavian was the sole ruler of the Roman Emperor, Empire, the Roman world, and he took the title Caesar Augustus. Just kind of want to point that out to you. You might not be into history. You might be like, oh, this is boring, blah, blah, blah. Just want to point out to you how this, the history that we learn, the history in schools and our textbooks all go, go along with the Bible. And the Bible is very much active in, in our history. And what was happening in that world and all that was setting up Caesar Augustus to be leader over this, this people at this time. And he said that he was going to have a census, a counting of his people. Uh, he wanted to have a census, and, and that's what he did. It, it, census had two real main purposes for the Romans. One, so they knew how much to tax, the assess the taxation, and how much money they should be getting. And two, uh, for those who had, uh, had the mandatory serving in the military would do so. Now, the Jews were exempt from the military service, so uh, for them, when the Jewish people were counted, they were being counted because of tax reasons. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 2, it says briefly, this was the first census that took place while um, Quirinus was governor of Syria. Now, you might be saying, well, what does this have to do with the, the, the story here? What does this have to do with Syria? Well, the, the fact is that he had some sort of say over Judea at this time. The Syrian leader was looking over Judea. Now, uh, it, it seems like historically Quirinius served Assyria a little bit after this time period in history. And something that the translation of the Bible here should say, took, the census took place right before that Quirinius became governor of Syria. I don't know, but nonetheless, for Judea, was ruled by Cyrenius, the Roman governor of Syria. Cyrenius or Quirinius, it's known by both names, uh, he uh, was the ruler. Okay, now let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It says, And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. 
So here we see a map. It's Mary and Joseph began in Nazareth, which is all the way up in Galilee. And they had to travel down in the land of Palestine here to uh, past Jerusalem, a little bit past to a place called Bethlehem. And, uh, and that's what God uh, called them to do is about 80 miles of a journey. Now we might think today that's not really far, but in those days it was a significant undertaking, costing a lot of time and money for them to travel that far. And Mary was with child. Now we often see the image of Mary riding on a donkey. It's synonymous. When we see a woman riding on a donkey and a man walking beside, we think of Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem, and that is a journey to Bethlehem. I just wanted to point out to you that the Bible doesn't talk about a donkey. We don't have any record of a donkey. That's just something that makes the story uh, more complete in our eyes in this modern telling of the story. But I want you to know the Bible doesn't talk about a donkey. And uh, maybe they did have one. Maybe they did ride that. Joseph was a carpenter. Maybe he made a cart and pulled Mary along in a cart. We don't know what really happened, but uh, we know they took this journey to Bethlehem. We always see images of them alone uh, because they're the stars of the story. Uh, but most likely they traveled in, in groups and maybe even large groups. They traveled together for safety. And, um, and so that was probably more like the image we would see as a large group of people traveling south from Nazareth for people going to their hometowns to be counted in this census. But anyway, they headed from Nazareth, which was in Galilee, to Bethlehem, which was down in Judea. And um, it was very significant that they were going to Bethlehem. God had this plan. See, Jesus was to be born in the lineage of David. King David was from Bethlehem. Bethlehem was known as the city of David. And Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David, just like it was prophesied. Now, I could imagine Jewish people going, oh, why a census and why do we have to travel? Why do we have to go all the way over here just to be crown, counted? They might not have liked what they were having to face in those times, but it was fulfilling prophecy and that's exciting. Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. He was eventually to be raised in Nazareth in Galilee. That's what the scripture said. God used this census to move Mary and Joseph from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to have her child be born in Bethlehem. God had a plan, even though it was, oh, it's a Roman Empire and they want to tax us more and they want to count us and they're just trying to control us. And we, they, God had a plan through that all. Sometimes we complain about our circumstances, don't we? But we always have to remember that even in tough situations or circumstances we wouldn't choose, God has a plan. And God uses those circumstances to bring his will to come. And I thank God that he has a plan so much bigger than any of us can understand. And sometimes we're like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And we might not ever know why did it have to be this way. But God has a bigger plan and he's putting all the pieces together. Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. He moved Mary and Joseph from Nazareth and he used this, this Octavian, this Julius I'm sorry, this uh, Caesar Augustus to do so. God had this plan and he's been working it out through the generations to bring his plan together. And God has a plan today. Jesus is king and he was to be born in the city of Bethlehem, the city of David. It says in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 through 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I share that Old Testament prophecy with you today, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was from the lineage of David, and he was establishing his throne on the throne of David, a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever. 
very significant that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And that's why God had this master plan of all the places it was here. God has all, so many things at point. He is all filled with this big master plan that is beyond our understanding. And it's exciting when we can see little pieces of it all coming together here. Bethlehem literally translates as house of bread. Even though Bethlehem is known as the city of David, it's literally translated as the house of bread. The proper place for him to be born, right? A place called house of bread. Not only was Bethlehem significant because it was the city of David, but that it was literally the house of bread. Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life, the bread that comes down from heaven. He is what we need to survive. And that bread that comes down from heaven to meet all of our needs. Jesus came down from heaven to the earth. And he came and was born in a place called the house of bread. And Jesus, the bread of life, was laid in a manger. A feeding trough. Think about that. The bread of life was laid in a feeding trough where animals ate. Wow. What a story. God orchestrated so many things that came together to fulfill his prophecies, prophecies about Jesus's birth. Mary and Joseph, they were living in Nazareth where Jesus would eventually be raised, but God used Caesar to move Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Jesus was born in the lineage of David. He was born in the city of David, which is also translated house of bread. <coughs> Excuse me, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus was placed in a feeding trough. He was born in a place where shepherds raised sheep for the temple. We talked about that last week. Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. There's so much symbolism. God is so good. As I read this story, I'm reminded that God has a plan, a plan bigger than me, beyond my understanding. God always has a plan. We look around and it might like look like chaos sometimes in our lives, in the world around us. Sometimes it seems like it's chaos and there's no plan. There's no, nothing going on that makes sense. But God has a plan. He is working things out that I can't even see. And I am grateful that I am in his hands and that he has a plan for me and my life. He has a plan for mankind and he is working it out. And even though we can't always see how all the pieces fit together, he has a plan and it's all coming into alignment with is exactly what he wants to fulfill. Let's give thanks tonight for God that he has a plan, he's working it out. He had a plan and he sent his son into the world to die for you and me. He became our sacrificial lamb. He is the bread of life, born in the house of bread for you and I. He is our sustenance and he will help us get through the next day. Let us thank God for all of that tonight. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you and praise you. You are faithful, you are good. We exalt you and lift you up. You have a plan and we thank you for that tonight. You had a plan to save our souls, to forgive us of our sins. You sent your son into the world and you had all these things that said that it needed to happen. Raised in Nazareth, but born in Bethlehem, in the lineage of David, and that he would be the Lamb of God. It would be announced at the Migdal Eater outside of Bethlehem. And all these things happened, things that were no cool coincidence and we read these things in the Bible and it's just reminding of us of how good you are how faithful you are and we give you thanks tonight for your faithfulness to us and Lord when we don't see the plan when we don't see why things are happening the way they are help us to just know that there, you have a big picture and you're putting it all together help us to have faith and trust in you tonight Lord, if anyone is listening tonight that does not know you for sure within their heart and just want to be set free because you paid the price for their sins, Lord, forgive them of their sins. Set them free that they would know life. Oh, and know the real gift that you are to us. We just thank you and praise you tonight that we're able to meet and gather here online. Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for the story that we read here in Luke chapter 2, 1 through 4. We give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Amen. We'll continue reading next week and continuing the story about the birth of Jesus Christ. We invite you to come back next Wednesday. You can always join us on Sundays. We have online services here as well and uh, services in person at 9 and 1030 in the building. We invite you to come and be a part of those services. If you're joining us in person this Sunday, our youth band will be sharing a, a Christmas song with us and we're excited about that. And um, we are collecting food for our local food bank and we have a list of those things um, available and if you're interested in that please reach out to us uh, just collecting donations for our local food bank and helping them out remember to keep supporting the ministry um, your tithes and offerings can be given online if you go online you can find a way to give but we thank you so much for your for your support remember god loves you and so do we <music>